Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this event. Um, today, we're going to be looking at Turkey's relations with the EU and the prospects for the positive agenda. Um, I think it's fair to say that Turkey-EU relations are no stranger to problems. When we look back over the decades, um, we can see that periods where relations have been harmonious um, are actually very few and far between. There are deeply rooted trust issues. As we all know, the accession process has been dead um, for many years. Almost all issues today between Turkey and the EU have become politicized and relations have also become more transactional. Now, when we look back over the, the problems of the past, um, I think we could say that traditionally domestic developments in Turkey um, undermining fundamental rights and freedoms have been the main source of a lot of the tensions. But I mean, there was a bit of a shift here, um, I would say from the end of 2019 into 2020, um, when relations actually hit an all time low um, over some developments in Turkish foreign policy, in particular Ankara's hydrocarbon exploration in the Eastern Mediterranean. Nevertheless, despite these difficulties, this relationship remains extremely relevant for both parties. So in an effort to improve the situation, um, given the importance of Turkey as a partner, uh, the EU introduced uh, this so-called positive agenda back in December, 2021. Now, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with the agenda, I'm not sure that would be many of you in the audience, but just in case, um, it basically offers Turkey um, the chance to make progress in a number of areas, for example, strengthening economic cooperation, including the upgrading of the customs union, uh, that's something that Turkey actually really wants, uh, and also progress towards visa liberalization, something that Turkey has been waiting for for decades and decades, uh, as well as enhanced cooperation in many of our areas. If Turkey de-escalated um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, engages constructively, um, including um, related to the Cyprus um, problem. Um, in the case that Turkey wouldn't play ball, um, then some measures uh, could possibly be placed on Turkey, for example, um, sanctions or other sort of punitive um, measures could be imposed. And at the same time, if Turkey does play ball um, and some things are delivered to Turkey, um, some of these measured measures could also be revoked um, if Turkey didn't continue um, to play ball, if I can put it that way. Now, when we look back over the last few months, um, we can see that there has been a continued de-escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and there's ongoing bilateral conversations between Greece and Turkey, um, which is a very positive thing. We've also seen in 2021 a change in narrative um, from Turkey, but also I would say from, from the EU, there hasn't been so many um, harsh statements. There's also been a return to high level meetings between the two sides. There's been quite a lot of meetings uh, since the beginning of this year, including of course, uh, the now infamous visit of uh, Michel and von der Leyen uh, to Ankara and the famous uh, Sofa Gate um, incident. Now, looking to the next couple of weeks, um, at the forthcoming um, June European Council, um, EU heads of state are going to be taking stock um, of the situation and decide on the next steps with Turkey. Now, this will be quite a careful balancing act, in my opinion, because there remains um, not one common voice really on how to proceed. So in the next hour, we're going to be looking at um, how things stand today, how things may proceed. Will the positive gender actually get off the ground and deliver something tangible to Turkey? Um, in particular, again, this upgrading of the customs union, or is there a big risk that it can become politicized uh, and bogged down by national agendas or member states, uh, which has certainly been the case in the past on many occasions. This is also what happened uh, to the first positive agenda that was introduced in 2011 uh, by the then commissioner Stefan Fuller. And this positive agenda, I mean, the 2011 one, contained quite a lot of the elements which are in this new one. Um, and how can developments in Turkey's domestic and foreign policy also impact 
uh, the positive agenda. And also we could look at, you know, other topics such as where, where there's possible potential for cooperation um, between the EU and Turkey and other areas. Now to discuss all of these issues, I'm really happy to be joined by three really great speakers uh, today who I'm now going to introduce very briefly. First of all, Thomas Frelison, um, head of the Turkey division in the External Action Service. Um, welcome to you. Um, Senem Aydan Duzgit, who is Professor of International Relations at Sabanja University and also Senior Scholar and Research and Academic Affairs Coordinator at Istanbul uh, Policy Center. Um, and last and certainly not least, um, Gunter Soifert, who's head of the Center for Applied Turkey Studies, otherwise known as CATS, um, at the German Institute for International Security and Affairs. Um, to the audience, um, please put your questions by the hand icon or by the chat box. If possible, please try and keep them rather short um, to save me having to read, you know, what's sometimes almost half an essay. Um, and if possible, can you please um, start to put them early on so that I can include them in the discussion with the speakers. Um, so now I'd like to first start by giving the floor to you, Thomas, uh, so you can give us a sort of overview um, of how things stand um, from the perspective of the External Action Service. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amanda. It's good to be with you this morning. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, so let me just briefly, briefly uh, as an introduction, give you a bit of an overview of how we see things. Um, as you mentioned, Amanda, Turkey is a very important neighbor for the EU. It's a candidate country, uh, but uh, we've had a very difficult relationship, especially over the, uh, the past years, and especially also given developments uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, a lot of attention has been um, given to Turkey. It has been discussed at the highest levels, uh, foreign affairs councils, and also European Council meetings. In fact, somebody was saying recently, it looks like uh, Turkey is, is going from one European Council to the next, and it's true, but it uh, the importance that is attached to the, um, the relationship and um, the importance that uh, leaders attach to getting the relationship uh, on, a, on a proper track. And the European Council agreed to launch a, a positive uh, political agenda uh, EU Turkey. This is, of course, work in progress, will take some time. Uh, and it all assumes that the de escalation we have seen uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, is, is uh, maintained. Um, you also saw, and you referred to it, Amanda, the, the joint communication issued by the High Representative and the Commission in March last year, uh, which fed into the um, uh, decision by the European uh, Council uh, in March, 25th of March, which is now the reference point for the work uh, we are doing and work uh, has been ongoing since in view of the European Council next week. Um, and I'll come back to this in a second. Basically, um, what the European Council decided was to welcome the de-escalation that has taken place. Um, and it reflects the fact that, of course, we're in a much better place now than we were last year. We were close to seeing military clashes in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. Um, and thanks to a lot of high level diplomacy, we managed to, um, to get this uh, on track, various EU presidencies uh, and also EU leaders were engaged in this. Um, and we have now created for trying to move ahead um, constructively and develop some new uh, positive tracks. Um, we have also seen that uh, Greece and Turkey have managed now to relaunch the exploratory talks, which is extremely good. Um, the Greek prime minister also met with President Erdogan in Brussels this week. Uh, in what was uh, quite a positive meeting. We also saw that on, on Cyprus, um, informal talks have taken place in Geneva recently. Of course, they didn't go as well as, as one could have hoped for, but nevertheless, um, the process is ongoing and um, preparations are underway for another informal uh, meeting, which we hope will uh, take place in the not too distant future. Um, so overall, we're in a better place than we have been, uh, even though the situation is fragile. Um, and of course, importantly, the rule of law human rights situation in Turkey remains a, a key concern. Um, it, it needs to remain in focus. It was also in focus when, when EU leaders were in Turkey uh, early April. Um, those of you who were at the conference uh, would have seen that um, they were quite outspoken on this. Uh, and, and of course, I mean, developments in this area will continue to cast, if you will, a dark shadow overall over the relationship. Um, it's not something that, um, that is going to be um, ignored. Um, and you mentioned it, um, Amanda, so what, what the European Council decided was to engage on a, a positive agenda focusing on four 
uh, key areas, the economic relationship, high-level dialogues, including counterterrorism and terrorism and regional issues, and also people-to-people -people contacts, and to do so in a phased, proportionate, and reversible manner, because as we know, the relationship is very fragile. So if there's a, <clears throat> a, a setback, if you will, in the relationship, this is also going to impact um, the way we're going to be able to, um, to cooperate. And of course, if things go really wrong, as was also set out in the communication in March, um, there are the, always the options of reverting uh, to sanctions, although this is clearly uh, something that nobody really engage in, and we, we hope we can um, avoid this. One important element also from, uh, from the European Council in March was the agreement by leaders to continue the assistance for refugees in Turkey. This is something that um, is definitely going to, uh, to be done. A uh, follow-up to all of this uh, has been underway um, and will be discussed by leaders next week. So certainly they will uh, revert to the refugee assistance issues on which uh, our colleagues in the commission have done a lot of work um, and are doing. On economic cooperation, what has happened is that Turkey has engaged um, with our commission colleagues on, on addressing uh, the current difficulties in, in implementing the customs union. Um, there was a good visit by the new Turkish trade minister in Brussels uh, this week, and we hope soon to see a meeting of the um, Customs Union Joint Committee, which hasn't met for a long time, and which will be focusing on trade, trade disputes. Um, and then in parallel, uh, the discussion is beginning in the Council among member states on the uh, mandate on Customs Union uh, modernization. You know, this has been stalled for three, four years. Um, and uh, the mandate, uh, negotiating mandate for the Commission needs to be finalized uh, in the Council before actual negotiations uh, with Turkey will take place. And maybe just a brief word on the customs union modernization, because I think it's a very important one, uh, not only for Turkey, but for the overall relationship. Um, once the mandate has been agreed in the council, uh, the, the negotiations with Turkey, of course, will take quite a long time. We're talking about uh, several years. Um, and uh, we see it certainly from uh, most of us in the EU, EU institutions, see it as an investment, a long-term investment in EU-Turkey relations that can help uh, drive uh, reforms and also provide for a rules-based framework um, for economic cooperation for the future. Uh, and it can help contribute to uh, provide a new dynamic in the relationship. So that's also why we think it's very important. But it's all in the hands of member states in the council. So how this proceeds uh, is up to member states. Um, uh, and as follow-up to the European Council also, there have been discussions on setting up new high-level dialogues focusing initially on uh, health and climate, which um, really are priority areas uh, of importance for both the EU and Turkey. And we see good potential for, for cooperation um, in, these, uh, in these and other areas, of course. On regional issues, uh, High Representative Borrell has uh, been um, heavily working in our relationship with Turkey. He's in fact in Turkey now. He's participating in the um, Antalya Diplomatic Forum and will have a meeting with the Turkish Foreign Minister also. And over the recent weeks and months, uh, we have had several uh, senior officials meetings uh, focusing on issues, Syria, Libya, um, and other issues. We just had uh, colleagues in, in, in Turkey this week uh, on these area issues also. And we see good scope for cooperation, although, of course, there have been differences um, on Syria and Libya. Uh, we see a lot of uh, scope for, um, for cooperation with Turkey on this. Turkey is an important regional player. And we see a lot of scope for uh, for cooperating in these areas. Also, also an um, issue is Afghanistan, uh, where Turkey is going to play and is already playing quite an important role. So, in conclusion, to be brief, um, we are in a better place than we have been. Um, we need to take a long-term view on the overall relationship. Um, it's too important um, not to move forward, even if. It may have to be incrementally um, and not as fast as, um, as we would have uh, wanted to. But Amanda, let me leave it there and I'll be happy to come back later also. Thank you, Thomas, for this, um, for this very, I think you managed to drill down on the key, the key issues um, very, in a very succinct way. But I'd just like to ask you one follow on question, um, if I may about the, uh, the upcoming um, European um, Council. I mean, President Anastasiades um, of Cyprus um, has said that um, he, could, he could veto um, progress on this positive agenda or hold it back at the upcoming Council because of what happened um, in, in Geneva. I mean, this is 
in my opinion, you know, rather an unfair assessment of, of how he sees the Cyprus problem. Um, but what, what extent do you think um, this is going to be um, a risk? Uh, and the second point refers to the European Parliament. I mean, the European Parliament came out with a report a few weeks ago, um, which is very scathing um, of, of Turkey. Um, and the, re the recommendation that came from the rapporteur, Mr. Sanchez, um, is that the positive agenda should be strongly linked to um, democratic reform in Turkey. I mean, to what extent can the European Parliament um, hold back um, this process of implementing a positive agenda, particularly the upgrade of the customs union? Yes. So listen, I mean, uh, what happens uh, at European councils, uh, nobody can predict. Uh, so I would also not predict what happens at the European Council next week. Uh, this is really up to EU leaders um, and uh, we'll have to see what happens. Um, and uh, as far as the European Parliament is concerned, uh, European Parliament plays a very important role and we very closely read everything that comes out of the European Parliament, including uh, the recent report. Um, sometimes the impression is given that um, other EU institutions don't uh, pay any attention to human rights and rule of law and only the European Parliament does that. That's, it's not entirely correct. Um, but certainly the European Parliament plays an important role. And, and you also, Amanda, mentioned the customs union. Eventually, when this has been finally negotiated and has to be adopted and put into force, the European Parliament will have a role to play. So uh, they clearly will have an, have an influence on this. And let me also add on that, I mean, um, uh, it's very clear that human rights rule of law will also uh, be a point uh, in the discussion among member states in the council when they finalize the mandate uh, for the negotiations on the customs union. Uh, so this is not something that uh, that is going to be put aside, but, but the European Parliament will eventually have a vote uh, and a voice in this also. Thank you very much, um, Thomas. Um, I'd now like to turn to you, um, Senna, um, to hear your views, I mean, as you're sitting in Turkey and have been working on Turkey for a very long time, how you view the current state of relations. Um, and maybe also you could explain what's behind, you know, Turkey's renewed interest or change of, let's say, change of narrative. Um, mm. Is it solely this positive agenda or is it something else? I mean, we've seen, you know, President Erdogan, along with other high ranking Turkish officials say they want to re-engage. They're still focused on EU membership. Um, all of these very nice things. So I give the floor to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, and also thank you very much for this event. Um, yes, well, first of all, let me perhaps start with your question, right, regarding where this change of interest in, in among the Turkish leadership. I mean, I think we would have to look at the sort of larger geopolitics of it and the changing global dynamics to understand the shifts in Turkish foreign policy. By the way, I'm not talking about a durable shift, but you know, something that's very pragmatic and something that might very, you know, very much be short term. But I don't think it's less related to the positive agenda that's been proposed by the European Union and more so with the change of leadership in the United States and a much more cooperative transatlantic relationship as well. So I think this is where we should seek the roots of this, um, you know, more recent, more positive messages from, uh, from the Turkish side. Um, because obviously the uh, proposed positive agenda had been there around for a while. We knew more or less the elements which, which constituted this agenda. So it's not entirely new. So it's not that which drives uh, the change in attitudes, but something bigger. Now, what is it that's bigger? I mean, obviously the Biden administration, uh, we know that Turkey is now struggling to find a new modus operandi with this new administration. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, talk about the recent Biden Erdogan meeting in Turkey. There was a lot of fear, although I don't think, um, you know, nothing you know, too significant came out of it. But these are all signals that Turkey is trying to find a new way of a dialogue and working together with the US administration. Now, this, is, this automatically reflects on how it uh, relates to the European Union and EU member states as well because we know that United States is not shying away from putting its weight, let's say on the Eastern Mediterranean, 
that this is a new era of transatlantic cooperation. I mean, it, it's of course fraught with frictions as well, but definitely more different than, much more different than what uh, Europe has experienced with the Trump administration. And plus also, uh, also we see that in the recent declaration where, you know, US and EU has pl pledged to work with Turkey collaboratively, uh, you know, although with a democratic Turkey. That's what they said. Of course, there you can't really figure out whether they mean that they will cooperate with Turkey if and when it's democratic or they will work with Turkey, hoping that it will become democratic one day. Now, that's kind of, you know, the wording there is a little bit fuzzy. You can take it and, and, and shift it and uh, take from it whatever you'd like. So I think that is the reason. Uh, so they're trying to balance their relationship with the West. <coughs> it's not possible to be alienated in the neighborhood anymore, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. <coughs> They've been, I'm sorry, excuse me, basically uh, going around alone for a very long time. Um, and they can't, Turkey cannot afford to carry on with that foreign policy any longer, especially with a changed US administration. Now, that would be my answer to your question. Now, on... The second um, issue, you know, about how I see this sort of recent turn of events, well, to be honest, I don't see anything, you know, any fundamental changes in, in what we have here. I mean, we have, as um, Mr. Frelison has pointed out, we do have, you know, certain steps, certain sort of positive signals, especially regarding the customs union. Uh, and renewed cooperation. But aside from that, a lot of it remains still extremely fuzzy. First of all, we know that this uh, you know, changing positive tone has a lot to do with the de-escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean. So that is uh, the prime reason I think that, uh, that the EU can now afford to adopt a more conciliatory tone. But there is also an emphasis that on this sort of phased, proportionate, reversible cooperation, right? Subject to conditionalities in March. Well, this is this is what's circulating. And the conditionalities in March, of course, were the conditionalities that were mainly uh, related to the Eastern Mediterranean and the developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. So here, of course, you don't see at least democracy and human rights as a part of that conditionality. So conditionality has become, you know, narrowed down or limited with, uh, with whatever is happening in the Eastern Met. Um, and I think this is becoming consolidated more and more with each council summit. So I think we'll have to wait and see if that's what comes out um, from the, the summit later on this month as well. But that's my personal expectation that it looks like, you know, we can expect a conditionality to be fixated and consolidated on the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, of course, the question that might um, arise there, and I think I've seen it in, in the chat box as well, in the q and it was the first question, if I'm not mistaken, uh, how can you insert democracy and human rights as a conditionality in the EU-Turkey relationship? That is extremely difficult to do. Now, obviously, it's the easy thing, you know, to point the finger at Europe and say, well, you know, Europe can't do anything about it. You know, they're too light on democracy and human rights, which I also agree with, yes personally speaking. But on the other hand, how do you incorporate democracy and human rights as a conditionality into a relationship where the EU also has key interests like migration and, 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 and other issues? And where, you know, when you put it, when you balance it out, where the incentive for the Turkish government to comply with that conditionality is very, very little compared to their perception of what they're going to get in return from this cooperation. So when you put it as such, you see the dilemma of the EU and Europe in general as well about how to incorporate this. Um, the same goes for customs union. I mean, I think it's good that, you know, the technical preparation is underway and that there seems to be, you know, there will be, it looks like there will be some progress here, but it's still unclear as to how this mandate will be agreed on. You know, previously it was democracy and human rights that held some member states like Germany back in approving this mandate, will that continue to be the case, especially now with a new government in Germany, or will that change? Now, I think that's also rather unclear. It, it remains to be seen. Uh, probably the most concrete thing that we're looking at for the time being is the continuation of the migration agreements in one form or another. 
So if there's one agenda where cooperation uh, looks like, you know, uh, will definitely continue, will be on the migration agenda. But here too, I think there are uh, rooms for improvement. And I think there are points in which we'll have to debate a little bit more because we have seen that the initial migration agreement also bears certain risks and it also has certain flaws that needs to be addressed for a more genuine and a more productive uh, cooperation on this front uh, as well. And that, of course, we can discuss uh, later on as well if we sort of unpack the migration issue a little bit. And I think that's what um, I wanted to say for the first time. Um, thank you very much, Senem. I would like to just ask you another question. Um, and this is more related to the Turkish opposition parties, because we hear a lot about the AKP, obviously the relationship with the EU, but I mean, there's not so much actually said about the sort of positions or engagement that Turkey's opposition parties, I mean, the, obviously the traditional one, the CHP, the, um, but some of the new parties, I mean, of um, Davut Olu um, and Ali Baba Jan, I mean, the, what sort of engagement, if any, have they had with, with, with the EU? I mean, is the EU, the relationship with the EU, how much of, a, how much of an important issue is it in their, in their sort of, in their, in their narratives or their policies? I mean, particularly when we're going forward, you know, into election periods, or is it a totally non-issue? Okay, thank you, Amanda. Well, obviously there are so many high profile issues in Turkey these days that relations with the EU does not rank, you know, you know, very prominently in the opposition discourse. You know, you have issues that relate to the economy, you have the general foreign policy issues, which are still not that prominent, you know, because economy and domestic governance and corruption, especially in the last few months, have, have, have taken center stage. So domestic issues are right now extremely um, hot topics on the opposition's agenda as well, and whether Turkey should go for early elections or not, and these are all being discussed. So the EU doesn't, uh, I'm afraid, doesn't rank very high on the agenda. But having said that, I think it also needs to be said that um, most of the uh, opposition parties, perhaps all of them, but since now we have so many little parties on the opposition parties on the fringes as well that I can't account for all of them, but most of the major opposition parties uh, are pro-European, at least in their rhetoric, right? Uh, that they do support Turkey's EU membership bid, that they believe that this government has turned extremely anti-Western and anti-European, and that you know, something needs to be done to steer the country away uh, further towards the West and to um, have a more genuine and a more constructive relationship with the EU. I think this is, uh, this is um, on the agenda of all of the major opposition parties, but of course, whether, you know, if they ever have a chance to um, come to power in the near future, whether they would be able to realize this in practice through policy practice is another question because we know that there are other domestic issues which might complicate the relationship with the EU. But right now, at least at a rhetorical level, even though it doesn't have very high prominence, definitely um, the opposition parties uh, adopt or seem to adopt a much more pro-European stance than the current ruling party. Wonder so thank, thank you so much, Senem. Um, I'd like to come to you, Gunther, um, to get the perspective from Germany, because obviously Germany has been a driving force um, in Turkey-EU um, relations. I mean, Angela Merkel, she's always been seen more or less as a, a safe a pair of hands, um, if I can put it that way. Um, so, of course, I'm interested to hear how you view the current state of affairs. But I mean, also, as was mentioned earlier, we're heading towards a German election. Um, and what could be the impact of this election result um, on the relationship um, between Turkey in the EU, if any? I mean, will it be like, could it be a continuation of what we have? Um, or if there's a different, you know, power that comes to power, um, could this shift the balance? Yes, thank you also from my side for the invitation and yes, and for the question. I think uh, it, there might be some changes or there will be definitely some changes. I think first on the European level, uh, I think it was, uh, it was due to uh, Angela Merkel's uh, long stay in office and uh, her more or less 
uh, successful management or not, but management of, of a number of European crises, be it the currency crisis or be it the refugee crisis, uh, that gave her some uh, authority and that uh, enabled her or allowed her also to be very influential uh, in the policies of Germany. And I think when we see that the last um, European councils uh, meet the European, the meeting of the European Council, the Council have been very reluctant to uh, play hardball with Turkey and uh, that Germany tries, tried to ag accommodate Turkey. And that uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, Angela Merkel, who naturally with the support of other states like Italy and, and, and Spain, uh, managed to steer this more accommodative course. Uh, the question arises if how uh, or how far uh, any other German uh, chancellor uh, would be able to uh, work with the same authority and to be able to, um, to bridge different approaches of European member states uh, towards Turkey. And therefore the question arises for me, uh, if the European Union will not be even more incapable of uh, steering a, a joint Turkey policy than it was uh, in, the, in the last sense, and we saw it in the last, in the last years. Uh, on the domestic level, I think now there is still a particular chance or that the Greens will be uh, a member of uh, the government. Uh, during the high times of the pandemic, there was great discontent uh, with the management of the government and there the Greens uh, came to unexpected and unseen um, um, accommodation of votes and they, for some days they had been the the leading party, but this has changed again, but still the, there is a, a, good, a good chance, uh, there is a possibility that the Greens will be part of a, of a government. And in this case, uh, there will be some, I think the Greens will put much more emphasis uh, on the democratic uh, conditions in Turkey. Uh, they are very well known for being very critical when it comes to arms sales and when it comes to some, uh, to the necessity or the uh, approach of, of, of a security cooperation uh, with Turkey. The Greens have a long history of being interested uh, in the Kurdish, in the Kurdish file, in the Kurdish question. And therefore, I think uh, the Greens, will it not make more easy uh, for, for the European Union uh, to, to, deal, to deal with Turkey? Um, if, I, if I may add some um, comments to what um, Thomas and, and, and Senem have, have said. Uh, Thomas drew a, a very positive picture. Uh, I think this is true and I, I, or, or let's, let's say, I hope that this will play out uh, in, in this way. I see two risks. I see uh, two risks of, um, of being, of, of European policy, of Europe policy being not uh, successful towards Turkey. One is on the, on the level of, um, or, one let's one 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 at the level of, of, of member states and, and, and European institutions. Uh, Amanda, you already mentioned uh, that uh, the Cypriot president uh, has talked about a possible veto, and you also mentioned that uh, the European Parliament uh, plays on a very different plays a very different tone when it comes to Turkey. And we all know that without the consent of the European Parliament, there will be no uh, no. Uh, no new contract, no new agreement uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on on the customs union, and therefore the question is uh, really uh, there, not only due to normative considerations, but how the EU can manage uh, to bridge uh, their, to bridge its uh, economic interests, its security interests, uh, with the with the normative agenda. This, is, this will remain very, very central. And I think there is also uh, the risk that European policy will not be successful, uh, even if all these things that I mentioned play out positive, that there is a possibility or that Europe will manage, the European member states will manage to agree on a policy and the European institutions will manage to agree on the policy. And I think there is still a risk, namely the risk that Turkey is not playing by the rules and that uh, the European Union is not um, in, uh, is, not in, is not able to, to assure that Turkey is playing by the rules. What do I mean with this? Uh, on the first, on the first uh, few, the uh, new policy of the European Council uh, is, I think, a huge step forward because it's not only 
not only that the member states arrived on a, on a joint decision, but also that the European Union tried in a way to establish a conditionality beyond, beyond uh, uh, the accession negotiations. Uh, a conditionality where the European Union puts forward clear expectations towards Turkey and announces that its policy will be according to the question if Turkey meets these expectations or not. Uh, but what we see that the European Union is now really venturing and working for a positive agenda, but Turkey uh, remaining silent uh, on a lot of uh, expectations of the European Union. What do I mean with it? Uh, there was the, in the, the, the conclusions of the European Council clearly state uh, that uh, Europe uh, expects the readmission of uh, refugees from Greece uh, before entering into negotiations uh, about the continuation of the refugee cooperation. But we saw that without these, uh, these um, conditions is being met, is being met uh, talks continue and uh, Europe seems to be ready for uh, the continuation of the agreement. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, aware, and uh, Thomas uh, told, told us now that there are now, um, that Turkey is at least has started to negotiate uh, the trade uh, irritants, but the council clearly expressed that first, the trade irritants that had been introduced by Turkey in the last years before starting the negotiations, um, and here also, I'm not sure if the European Union is really living up to its own con conditions. And the same is true, I think, uh, when we always uh, uh, underline the importance uh, of the improvement of the rule of law and of, of, of human rights in Turkey. And I think there also, uh, we don't see any, uh, yeah, any moderation of, 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 of the government's policy uh, in this regard, quite to the, con to the, to the uh, contrary. Uh, we see now that there is a file to, to, ban, to ban the HDP. We see enormous pressure uh, on, on civil society. Uh, when, when, when we look at, for example, at, uh, at the university and uh, even, even in foreign policy issues, uh, Thomas mentioned Cyprus. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't see any moderation of Turkish policy in, Cyp in Cyprus. We know that Turkey uh, has uh, now uh, uh, announced that it is not longer longer bound to the international agreed frame for a solution of the, of the, of the Cyprus issue, but is now working for the recognition or has announced that it will work for the recognition of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And last week there had been reports of how intense uh, inter the, the, the mingling of, of, of or how intense Turkey meddled into uh, the uh, election of the uh, president of state in the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And therefore here also, even when it comes uh, to the conditions uh, put forward uh, regarding Turkey's behavior in the Eastern Mediterranean, we see now that the energy minister has announced that Turkey is starting again uh, drilling. And this is the reason why the Cyprus president uh, threatened uh, with, with, with a veto. And uh, Therefore, I think the, Euro the European Union has really to discuss uh, if it is going uh, to, to live up to its own uh, standards, not to its own standards, but to the conditions it, it announced. And I think uh, the European Union should use um, the very positive developments uh, on an international scale that were where well, um, Senem talked about. We have now had a, a week of, of with, with a lot of summits, G7, NATO, EU, US cooperation. And therefore, we, in, in, in these meetings, there was a lot of talk of cooperation, not only in economy and climate change, but also uh, towards uh, of, uh, a common posture towards uh, autocracies, because uh, we see the rise of autocracy as a risk for uh, the uh, liberal uh, economies. And therefore, the question is if uh, the European Union uh, is, not a, is not able to, to make this one central part of its policy towards Turkey, then, the, then uh, what uh, really is the effect or uh, the impact of, of, of such declarations? As, as they had been made after, after, after the meetings of the no, leaders. Thank you, Gunther. You, you yes. made a lot of really important points there, um, which I now want to turn back to Thomas, actually. Um, if he's able to respond to some of those points, I mean, about the EU not living up to its own conditionality and some of the other points he raised, um, but also regarding the question we have here from Ege, um, Alp, Alp, 
uh, who's asking um, how will rule of law and democratization be integrated into conditions in a new customs union framework without blocking the entire process? Yes, thank you very much. Um, a lot of good points made uh, both by, by Sinem and, and uh, Gunther. Uh, so, I mean, I, uh, Gunther made a lot of uh, good points, and of course, there's a lot of risks in all of this, uh, and, and Gunther was very uh, clear in, in articulating these. Um, if I take them a bit uh, one by one, um, on Cyprus, of course, the situation is very difficult. I mean, certainly uh, the situation is not rosy, but we did have the first uh, informed discussions in many years, and preparations are underway, hopefully for a second round. Clearly not easy, uh, but um, but at least we have a process underway, and, and this has to, uh, has to continue. And I think part of our job is also to create the environment that allows this uh, to go ahead, if you understand what I mean. I mean, if we have positive momentum in EU-Turkey relations, this can also and will feed into uh, positively, hopefully, uh, into other processes as well. So this is part of the whole picture. Uh, many, many of these things are clearly linked. Um, on trade, yes, I mean, the language in the conclusions is that these are parallel processes. Uh, so if we don't get any good uh, progress on dealing with trade disputes, you will also not see the mandate on the customs union on a, a discussion in the council going ahead constructively. So these are parallel processes. Um, and that's why it's so important um, uh, to engage. And that's why it's important that the Turkish trade minister was in Brussels and that we'll hopefully soon have a meeting of the uh, Joint Customs Union uh, Committee, which we hadn't, haven't had for, for a very long time. So these are parallel, quite important to point out. And our refugee assistance, the European Council has decided um, to continue this. The structure of the European Council, this was not linked to parts of the conclusions. So this is a decision that has how it is going to be, uh, the amount and everything um, is, is being sorted out, but that decision has been, has been taken. And yes, I mean, rule of law, human rights, conditionality, um, and I saw on the Q&A, somebody asked also Van der Leyen's uh, comment um, um, on making this um, uh, an integral part of the relationship. You know, quite apart from the individual conditionality, is the overall relationship. Of course, the accession process is on a standstill, mainly because of the human rights. Accession funding for Turkey has been cut dramatically also because of that. So that's uh, a direct impact. And, and then um, it will, you know, provide to the quality of and depth of the relationship. There's absolutely no doubt of that. And uh, in terms of the customs union uh, mandate negotiations, this is for member states to find, as you know, all uh, new uh, trade agreements the EU concludes has human rights clauses. And I personally would be surprised if there wouldn't be such um, a clause in the mandate that's given to the commission. Um, I think it has been flagged by several member states already. And um, um, I'm sure this will be done. This doesn't mean that the process can't uh, move ahead. And as I said, uh, these negotiations will take, uh, as, as, as negotiations take years. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's a process that can help, as I said earlier, uh, move the reform process forward in Turkey in the economic field, but hopefully also uh, in other areas. And there may be changes in Turkey um, as, as these negotiations proceed that will move in, in a better direction. Completely agree with Gunther. Um, that the situation now is absolutely dismal and it's um, it's an awful situation. Um, but we have to find ways of um, addressing these and moving forward um, in, in, in concrete ways. Uh, so definitely not an easy, easy um, but I think we have initiated a process that can um, bring us uh, better forward. But, and as I mentioned in my introduction also, you know, there's a two-track approach. There's the road of the positive agenda. And if things go wrong, there's the alternative, which has been spelled out clearly in the joint communication. We don't want to go down that road, but if things go wrong, I mean, that's always an option. Um, but um, I think for the moment, uh, we are on the right track and we have to do whatever we can to, to stick to that track. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, um, Thomas. Um, now we have a question here from Birte uh, Scorpion, and I'll put it to you, Senem, um, if you don't mind. This is about the unpacking of the migration um, part 
um, of this discussion. And she's asking, could you share your view on the impact for Turkey EU positive relationship um, of the Greece law that declared Turkey a, a safe third country for asylum seekers from Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Somalia. Um, if you don't mind taking that one, then. Um... No, I don't mind at all. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you for the question as well. Um, well, I mean, regardless of the declaration, I think we can all safely agree that Turkey is not a safe country for refugees, uh, not from Syria and not from elsewhere. Um, and I think uh, this is something that was, of course, conveniently disregarded by the EU-Turkey statement. Um, but that doesn't matter. We are, you know, where we are with this. Now, I think the challenge here is for the next stage is to make Turkey a safer country for refugees from Syria and elsewhere and work with the European Union in making that possible. Now, to do that, I think the new migration deal, uh, of course, I mean, rightly so, the migration agreement focuses on returns and border controls. I'm not saying that these are not important, that they are, but I don't think we should exclusively be focusing on these. I think any revised agreement has to adopt a more sort of, uh, you know, um, an increased emphasis and take it to its center, a rights-based integration scheme that focuses on the social cohesion of the migrants that exist in Turkey. Because these people are not going anywhere. They are going to be in Turkey, you know, to stay. They don't have any intention to go back, you know, who knows what they will go back to, even if the time comes and that there is a peaceful Syria that they can go back to. And the only way to release the migration pressure on Europe and also to sort of match that normative gap that exists uh, on the basis of the fact that Turkey is not really a safe country for migrants is to ensure that the next step or the next stage of the migration deal focuses on rights-based integration and social uh, cohesion. Now, if that happens, and I know that this would not deliver you know, results in, 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 in a few days, this is something that would uh, have to take a longer view um, to the migration problem and to migration cooperation. But this would also be very useful. This would be useful in a decreasing uh, dependency on Turkey and making the migration issue hostage to larger geopolitical issues. This would uh, introduce more sustainable, durable solutions towards integration. And of course, it would result on more meaningful burden sharing that actually benefits the refugees, right? It would, of course, result in a decline of numbers, which is what the EU wants to see, fine. But then this could also result, this could be basically, this could be serving a number of objectives at the same time. I think this is the type of a migration agreement that would be less toxic uh, a mystery is that even though there is a lot of migration cooperation, even though the numbers are down, uh, you know, I'm not sure if the European publics are even aware that the, the EU-Turkey migration statement has a lot to do with it. So if you ask, for instance, there was a recent ECFR survey, which I found, you know, very alarming that, um, you know, Turkey is seen as serious adversary by a majority of the European publics, even more so than Russia and China. Now, this is, of course, a problem. This is a big issue. And this wasn't always the case, right? So we can't just say, oh, this is Islamophobia. This is this and that. No, it's not, right? Part, I mean, obviously, one part of it might have to do with cultural factors and Islamophobia, whatever. But if we consider the fact that this wasn't, Turkey wasn't perceived as such 10 years ago or 15 years ago, shows that there is something larger at work that's taking place. And even though there is all this cooperation that is perhaps contributing uh, to the loss of ground for, let's say, far right extremist parties and some European um, capitals, this is not really captured by the publics as well, because because the deal is normatively problematic um, from various respects. And this has to be taken into consideration when it's being revised. And it looks like it's most likely to be revised. Um, thank you, Salem. And I agree, I very much agree with what you said 
um, regarding public opinion um, on Turkey, because I think it's rather worrying, actually, the amount of statements we hear which links Turkey actually in the same bracket as Russia and China. I mean, I find this extremely unuseful um, and entirely in incorrect. It's very incorrect, um, but it seems to penetrate quite well into um, societies um, in Europe, uh, among, among other things as well. Um, now I'd like to come back to you, Gunther. Um, we touched before a bit on, on Germany, on the German elections. Um, but of course, next year, there's also a very important election that's going to be taking place in France. Um, Turkey has systematically been in election campaigns in, Fran in France. Um, is there a risk this will happen again the next year? I mean, let's put it let's put it, you know, honestly, the relations between President Macron um, and President Erdogan haven't been fantastic. I mean, the relationship between France and Turkey hasn't been fantastic over the last few years. So is there a risk this could have a blowback effect again on relations with the EU? Or would it remain sort of a bilateral? Yes, thank you. That's a, diff a difficult question. I think we 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 all agree, and and I'm naturally not not an expert on France, but uh, in my in our conversations with with French think tanks, uh, we we really see that France feels not uh, only since yesterday, but for a long time, uh, sees Turkey as a rival. She started naturally in the Middle East, in in in, in Syria, and in 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 the Lebanon, in Lebanon, uh, and now uh, even more uh, uh, in Africa, where France has a very well entrenched uh, economic and, and 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 military position, and and sees Turkey now. Uh, being active in, in, in Africa, both uh, militarily and economically, and uh, is confronted with a very uh, vivid and very dynamic uh, economic, economic actors and, and, uh, on, on the ground, and uh, a very, yeah, uh, also decisive uh, uh, military presence and a strategic uh, policy uh, towards Africa uh, from Ankara. And uh, on, on the top of that, uh, there is naturally the, uh, fact that uh, we see uh, that when it comes to uh, societal integration in France, uh, that might be France made, might, might be the country in, in Europe with the uh, greatest difficulties uh, in integrating uh, its uh, migrant uh, population. Uh, we also in Germany faces a lot of difficulties, but I think still in France, uh, the, um, the gap between, between the uh, ethnically French and the ethnically migrant uh, uh, population uh, is deeper than, than, uh, than in Germany and, and, and in other countries. It's only, um, only an, on, a, on an anecdotal note, there was uh, now, in the, we have the European Championship and there had been a poll uh, in, in different countries that uh, participate in the championship. And uh, there was uh, people were asked how much uh, do you, how how great do you see the chance of your of your team to win to win the uh, the championship? But there has been a, another question: whom would you don't whom would you not like at all to to win the championship? And uh, in France, and this was the highest rate among all states: sixteen percent of the French said we don't want that the French are winning the championship. And <laughs> <laughs> and it was only in France that the own that the own that the own um, that the own team was so much disliked. At the same time, the French are the most optimistic that they are going to win the championship as a society. But I think this is also a small hint how difficult uh, things uh, stand uh, stand in France. And we know that um, um, the uh, Marie Le Pen uh, has a good chance to 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 beat uh, Mr. Mr., uh, Mr. Mr. Macron, and that Mr. Macron uh, to 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 counter this challenge uh, is now playing a very uh, rightist, a very uh, state-centered, law and order-centered, and a very critical, migrant critical uh, discourse. Uh, and that it is particular to, um, to um, communities, to uh, really rich communities from Turkey that uh, most, that, that are rejecting uh, the demands uh, of, of, of France uh, to integrate uh, into the forcing state structure for the integration uh, of, of Islam. And therefore, there is, from the, from the French perspective, there is a, a picture of uh, mounting difficulties uh, at home with 
all in, in all questions of migrant integration. On the top of that, uh, on, on the the most the most difficult, uh, the Turkish communities, and at the same time, uh, a vivid uh, economic and also civil society uh, activity uh, in Africa. And there are fears that uh, there is even a cooperation between Turkey and some Islamist groups uh, in Africa. At least in France, these these such such uh, concerns uh, are are mentioned, and therefore. I see that naturally with uh, the elections in France, it will be again extremely difficult uh, to, to, to arrive at a joint policy. But let me, let me, let me add, and I think Senem provoked me with this very important and I think uh, theoretically uh, totally right, uh, rights-based approach for the integration of refugees. And I think this uh, even more underlines that uh, for cooperation with Turkey, be it economic, but also be it uh, in the frame of the refugee cooperation, uh, Europe has to, uh, is not allowed to put questions of rule of law and of uh, the stability of institutions, of uh, check and balances, um, and of uh, democracy, uh, overall democracy, on the back burner. Because we are talking about a right-based uh, integration of refugees, and we are seeing that uh, a lot of Turkey's, uh, of, of uh, large part of Turkey's population, uh, are not feeling uh, that they are living on a right-based uh, relationship with their government and with their country. We see a lot of uh, mayors are, are, are removed without uh, juridical decisions, without court decisions that. Um, Members of parliament are uh, criminalized, criminal, criminalized because they are speaking their mind in front of the parliament. And uh, that uh, almost 20% uh, of, of, the, of the Turkish lawmakers are now faced with the possibility of, of, of uh, being stripped of their impunity. And uh, 160 of them from the opposition and only 20 due to corruption allegations of the, of the ruling parties. And this tells us something about the state of law in Turkey. And therefore, I think for, for enhanced cooperation or for to make cooperation with Turkey at any case more uh, trustworthy, more predictable, we need to have an emphasis also on the, on the, on the, uh, on, on the, rule, on the rule of law. Thank you, um, Gunther. We only have three minutes left. Huh? Time goes by, by far too quickly when you're having fun, and I would have many more questions to ask. Um, but I just want to actually finish with the, the question here from Klaus Klipp, um, which is to, to all of you. And he's basically you know, saying that the current, um, the current policy, um, I guess he's talking about the accession process, um, no longer functions. I mean, it's basically dead. Um, is it an alternative or perhaps the question is is either the EU or Turkey really ready to accept um, an alternative to this you know dead um, accession process um, so Thomas would you like to start yes and uh, let me say right away that this whole issue of uh, accession status or not it's not something that is being discussed uh, in the council at all. I mean, one or the other may, you know, uh, sometimes uh, raise it, but it's not being taken up. And I think it reflects the fact that most, and certainly also most people in the EU institutions um, realize that it would be completely counterproductive, you know, to start that discussion. I mean, the accession process is in a standstill. Uh, let it be that, and let's try to map out a way forward uh, where we can. Because if you reopen that question, um, you would uh, certainly undermine those pro-European forces uh, that there are in Turkey, and you would play into those who would like a different direction for Turkey. So I think that's something uh, we all realize. So it's it's not I can I can just tell you in Brussels it's not something that is uh, that is under discussion. Um, hand over to you, Senem. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. Um, I agree uh, with Mr. Frelson that I think it's a good thing that it's not under discussion in the sense that I don't think anybody has any illusions, right? I mean, uh, both on the European side and also on the Turkish side. I mean, if one has to be realistic, we know that there is no accession perspective in the foreseeable future, let's say in the short to medium term, but who knows what's going to happen in the long term. 
Um, but I also think that even though, of course, the Turkish government says that, you know, the, 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 the goal of Turkey is to become a member, they also know that they are aware that this is just rhetorical. So they also don't harbor any illusions on their side. But I think it's important that it's kept there. So legally speaking, institutionally speaking, that it's there, frozen somewhere. But the fact that it's just there means that there will potentially be new grounds on which EU-Turkey relationship can be rebuilt if and when Turkey one day returns to normalcy and if and when it returns to democracy. We don't know when, we don't know how, but I think you know, we can assume that this could be a way to restart, to re-kick the EU-Turkey relationship if and when this happens. Because I think, again, if we have to be realistic, we'd have to also assume that you know, there won't be any, any sort of gain for neither Europe or for Turkey to sort of to brush it off, like legally speaking, to suspend it. Um, because you know what, what, what's to be gained by doing that? You, you don't have to work with this positive agenda or whatever you have out there, even if you have the accession process formally frozen or not. So, um, so there's nothing to be gained from it. You'd only give more ammunition to anti-Western forces in Turkish society. And there's not much point in opening up for discussion because then, you know, again, you would hurt the, this time, the Western forces in Turkish society. So I think the best thing is just to keep it there uh, and, you know, for a, a rosier day, if that day ever comes. I totally agree with you, uh, Senem. Um, do you agree, Gunter? Is this the right is this the right road to go down? Let's wait for a rosy day to come. Uh, I think we don't have another another alternative. Uh, not not I think not only wait. We are not we are not allowed to wait because we we are engaged in, in daily politics and we have to act. But uh, I agree with what what was Thomas and, and and Senem said. But I think it is even more important the fact that this question is raised always. Uh, and this shows us that the, neither the European public, be it, be, it, be it the voters of Le Pen uh, or be it the voters of the Green in, in Germany, uh, that the European public is not, uh, will not allow a, 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 a European policy that is looking only at security cooperation and economic cooperation with towards Turkey. Because we are engaged with Turkey, at least in Germany now for 40 years, and we are discussing Turkish policies and we are in daily encounter with persons from Turkey. And, uh, Tur and Turkey is a candidate country and at the same time, a challenge to European security. And therefore we are always discussing in, 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 in on the backdrop of these two of these two dynamics, and we will be able only to steer a policy, a, a joint policy uh, towards Turkey, if this policy, if this policy is both uh, taking into account uh, European needs for security, European economic interests, but also uh, the state, the rule of law. Uh, and the state of democracy in Turkey. Otherwise, we will not be able to form such a policy. And I think only if we are able to bridge these different and, and sometimes uh, contradictory um, goals, we are able to steer a, a common policy. And I think also, and I think I have underlined it, only if there is a minimum of, of, of rule of law, and Turkey will be a predictable partner. And then only Again, if this, if there's a minimum of rule of law and of, and of working uh, institutions, uh, even uh, interest-oriented um, uh, European policy has a chance to be successful. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I have to now draw this event to a close. I want to thank all of you for joining us today and um, for sharing your insights. You know, on a very, I would say, you know, difficult topic. I mean, Turkey uh, and the EU have, you know, many shared interests, and it's a very important relationship for both. But that doesn't make it any easier uh, for the two to get along harmoniously, um, as we've just heard. But we need to keep trying, simply because this relationship is is so important. Um, we could have gone on for longer. There's many issues that we didn't touch on. Um, Turkey is actually a fascinating country to actually work on. Um, so thank you all for joining uh, us today. I hope to see you again in an event in the future. EPC will be continuing to follow developments um, in Turkish 
um, foreign and domestic policy. Um, thank you for the audience um, for joining us. And I wish everybody um, a great remaining um, Thursday. Thank you.